thanks for this invitation and this uh, uh, session that we have organized here. Thanks, friends, for being here today. Uh, we'll try to make it as short as possible, and it's much better that we have, uh, you know, a dialogue that makes it all the more easy to understand the topics. Uh, Sudhin actually has helped me to give me a takeoff. This is a story which I often talk about because people ask me, and he also reminded that, that I should talk about that, about the whole Bachchan incident. So maybe we should start with that, which some of you might be knowing, or some of my friends already know, but I'll still say that because it's good to take off from there. Yeah, it's true. I, this was around 10 years ago. 10 years ago when I was uh, new into Iraq. I had gone there just for a six-week mission, essentially to replace uh, another colleague of ours who had been covering the Iraq conflict right from uh, the launch of the invasion on March 19, 2003 and it was going on for quite some time and he needed a break. So I had gone to replace him because our bureau chief in Iraq had seen my reporting from Godra at that time, just before, two years before that from Gujarat. So probably he thought, you know, I can do some conflict reporting. So let, let's try him in Iraq. So I had gone for six weeks to replace this friend. And uh, this is when it happened, like uh, we had, Iraq at that time was not just about the US or uh, Saddam or uh, the new Iraqi forces. It was a mess and it's a bigger mess now, but that time it, it had already started. And uh, Americans at that time were fighting on one hand with Saddam loyalists. Saddam had been captured at that time and he was held in a US uh, prison. But his loyalists were still out there, and they were fighting. Uh, uh, the insurgency had started, which was led by uh, Sunni Islamists, uh, loyal to Saddam. At the same time, there was a group which believed that the Americans should go now. Saddam was captured, and your job was done. You came here to liberate us, so you better go now. And these were uh, nationalists. Now, but they were largely Shia. Shia Muslims and Shia militias. Now you need to understand that Iraq essentially is a, a majority Shia country. It's the second biggest Shia population uh, among the Muslim community in the world. First being uh, Iran, which is the biggest around eight, eight crore, which is the larger, the biggest uh, Shia country. And then you have uh, Iraq, which, uh, which is a 2.5 crore population of which 60% is Shias and the rest are uh, split between Sunnis and uh, Kurds, as we call them. So this was a rebellion which started suddenly against the U.S. forces from uh, Shia militias, and that was one day when we were covering. We were. We, I was told to cover this war and uh, this rebellion, which was in Najaf, which is the holiest shrine of Shia Islam, where uh, Imam Ali is uh, buried, and that's like the number one, the number one shrine. Uh, holy place for Shia Muslims across the world. Everybody, every Shia feels at one time in his life he has to go there, just like uh, Makkah Medina on a Hajj. So the rebellion was right there in the shrine. The militants were inside and Americans were outside surrounding and we were covering it on a daily basis. So that was the day when one of those days when me and my translator, we were uh, snatched by a group of militants and we were taken into the desert uh, like miles outside the whole uh, the battlefield and uh, we were just taken into this prison open barren uh, broken down uh, mosque it was open and the car went inside the taxi we were like there were four or five of them and we were two of us and we were into the mosque so we entered the mosque and uh, that was scary it was scary because there were like around roughly 150, 200 fighters, militants inside. You know, all black clad, guns, grenades, everything, totally masks. They all were completely covered. And, okay, that was the moment when I thought that, you know, this, is, this could be the last day. You know, we need to play it very cool. And uh, they all came running around, who are you guys, what's happening? So the guys who captured us, the small unit of this four or five guys, they were calling us as American spies, uh, uh, Jasus. Ameriki Jasus. So there were agitation going on. They were really angry, furious, agitated. And all these people are basically youngsters who had picked up 
arms overnight to fight uh, Americans. So there was this whole recklessness going around, you know, sweaty passion around. People are just trying to uh, barge inside, trying to hold uh, somebody grabbing here, somebody grabbing from that side. It, it, it was a big mess. And, and what I realized was that was the spot, that was the back operation center where the fighters were gathering and supplies were reaching on the battlefield front line. So that was their command center. So we were in a uh, proper uh, mess out there. And then the whole thing, then we were dumped into a, into a, a room inside a mosque and not looked for quite a few long hours. Towards the evening, uh, somebody knocked the door. Uh, we were dragged out. And again, there was argument going on what to do with this guy. They had taken our laptops, our satellite phones, everything. And we were totally clueless. The office in Baghdad was trying to reach us. There was no phone connectivity with us, nothing. And uh, we were totally clueless what to do. You know, we couldn't communicate outside. And the biggest problem was, I don't know Arabic at that time. Even now, I don't know. But now I can understand. But that time, I was totally blank. It was my first uh, assignment in the Middle East, not just Iraq. In the Middle East, I had never been there. So I don't know Arabic. They don't know English. And the only guy who could communicate was my translator, come colleague. And uh, he was trying to help out as much as possible, but they were not listening to him. They were basically focused. Because at that time, foreigners were hated. And especially if you're seen with all this equipment, high-tech equipment, like uh, you know, big on or uh, mobile phones and satellite and laptop, they think you're working with the American forces. You know, they will not, there is no rationality involved in arguments. You are jasus for them. So it was going on. So again, we were dumped back. A few more hours passed. Then another knock on the door, and again we were taken out. And then we see one civilian dressed guy, along with another unit of this, all this black clad, gun totting uh, militants. So then that, the guy who was dressed in civilian clothes, could speak a bit of broken English. So I was, now I can start communicating with him a bit. So I said that, look, I'm a journalist, I'm a Sahafi, I work for the French, who, are, who have not who are not part of the alliance which uh, attacked Saddam. Uh, and I'm an Indian journalist. I'm an Indian, so it's again nothing got to do with I'm a completely third, fourth country, whatever you call it, from the, actually, we are not Americans, we are not the first country which is involved into the conflict, neither I'm Iraqi, which is the second country involved, neither I'm among from any of the allied forces or what. We are from this. So he started cooling down, he started taking up all our uh, identity cards, he started checking again, which, which they had already taken. In all this mess, when the things were, there was nothing, the tension was still brewing because his colleagues and his fighters were still very agitated and, you know, like, uh, hitting or like trying to trick us with guns here and guns there. And Salam was my, Salam, my translator, a really brave Iraqi. He was helicopter pilot in Saddam's uh, military before becoming a translator, become journalist with us. So he was a very elegant Iraqi, you know, and he usually is very calm, quiet, and elegant, but that moment he was so agitated. And, you know, like a strong Arab speaking very loudly, you know, this, that, you know, we are doing that, we are journalists, we are this, how can you hold us, and stuff like that. So I was getting a bit panicked. I said, why are you raising your voice? I mean, that could be enough to just trigger, just pull a trigger, just cool down. He said, let me handle this, let me handle this. In that whole chaos, we had this one fighter who was trying to say something to me. You know, Bashan, Bashan. I initially couldn't get it. What is he trying to say? Then he said, Shole, Shole. That kind of struck me somewhere. Are you talking Amitabh Bachchan? Yes, Amitabh Bachchan. Shole, ye dosti. Nahi chodenge in his Arabic, Hindi accent. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am, I am from, I know Bollywood. I know. I know, uh, I know, India. yes, I am from India, I am from Bollywood, I know Bollywood, we are from Bachchan's land. I said, Bachchan, Mazboot, Bachchan, Mazboot. I said, oof, that broke the ice, as I often say, you know, that just brought the whole tension in that mosque, suddenly down in the compound of the mosque, and then we could communicate during that, look, guys, you know, think. And then that's when I slightly brought in the whole Islam angle, saying that if you kill a journalist, you, you, you are saying that you are fighting uh, a jihadi war out here with the Americans. Killing a journalist is the last thing you want to do. You know, you, you don't want the blood of a journalist on your hand. Doesn't serve your purpose, and uh, it doesn't. Uh, it it kind of again uh, tarnishes even your whole argument of uh, holy jihad and everything. So there's no point. And then things started cooling, and they realized that we genuinely were journalists, and uh, finally uh, allowed us to go. 
but as I often say, we were picked up like miles away and they didn't even drop us where they had picked us. So we had to walk in like almost 20 kilometers, just he and me into, in the desert till we got back to where our car was and from where we were picked up. So that was how I would meet Mr. Bachchan and say, thank you. <laughs> you know, it helps because he's the most popular man in the Middle East. After Mahatma Gandhi, there is only uh, Mr. Bachchan. There is nobody in between. Anywhere you go to any Middle East countries, it's Mr. Bachchan. And these days, it is Shah Rukh. So every day in Egypt, when I go to my office in a taxi, I am either Bachchan or a Shah Rukh. Makes me feel good. Why not? But you know, that's how we Indians are known in the Middle East. Having <coughs> uh, touched upon this story, the, the whole topic is what is happening today? Why is this mess where we are today in this region which is so close to us historically, politically, and even in terms of uh, relations? We have, have uh, friends, families staying, working there for decades. Very quickly, I would like to just take you back to uh, a bit of a historical perspective which Sudhin briefly mentioned about, but get, uh, just to understand the whole uh, rise of this uh, political Islam and the whole uh, hard line. We need to go back to 79, which I always say is very, very strong cutoff period in modern history. 79 is when the modern history's biggest revolution happened in Iran, the Iranian revolution, where for the first time the world saw a cleric becoming head of the state. That was the classic example of political Islam at its supreme best. The supreme commander of Iran was a cleric. There was no other country which had seen that kind of uh, political structure taking place. He toppled the monarchy of uh, Shah Raza Pahlavi in 79 and then uh, installed a new political system which was led by a cleric, uh, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, you know, the revolutionary leader of uh, modern history. I don't see anybody even coming anywhere close to uh, the uh, the setup which he installed uh, in our part of the world. And to me, since then, our part of the world uh, really changed, really changed in the true sense, right on the ground, politically, uh, uh, in terms of everything that we see today. Because that is where a lot of uh, people started getting inspired, that if things can happen in Iran, it can happen anywhere else. That's also the year, 79, which we saw the Soviets invaded Afghanistan at the same time. And that's when we had these mujahideens from Arab countries, including Osama bin Laden, going into Afghanistan to fight the Soviets. A very crucial time. The same year started around the same, uh, same year, just within months, few months here and there, and we started watching uh, Soviets being fought by increasing number of mujahideen fighters coming from Saudi Arabia, Yemen, even Egyptians. Uh, and uh, many other Gulf countries. And you had these, all these people going and fighting. It went on for 10 years till, till almost the breakup of USSR, uh, 89, you know, the whole, in, in fact, people and historians say that Afghanistan fight was one of the big reasons also to break economically uh, USSR. So it was such a big war. And that's the time when you had, and immediately after that, as Sudin said, we had the Kuwait invasion by Saddam. It's the same time when Iran was again simultaneously fighting with Saddam's forces. So you had this, you know, small, small, small issues developing. And on a broader scale, you also had the ideological conflict between Islamic world itself. You know, as, as we know that today the global uh, Muslim population, let's say, is around 1.4 billion. Of that, 85% is Sunni Muslims and 15% is uh, Shia Muslims. Now there has been a historical clash, which was never really glaringly evident in modern last 400, 500 years, but probably there was this simmering tensions building between the two sects. And that started coming on with Iran, Iraq, Saddam being Sunni, and Iran and Mr. Uh, Khomeini being Shia, the whole conflict started. So the tension started brewing their ideological tension in that region. And that built up this increasingly small groups we started fighting to look for fight uh, for fighting for local grievances we started seeing it small groups fighting saddam inside iraq itself uh, we started seeing separatist movements in iran itself fighting uh, mr khomeini himself so all these conflicts started emerging inside these two three countries 
But the biggest thing which happened, which took a decade after that, was 9-11, the second big event which changed our world. The whole thing started slowly, slowly growing in Afghanistan, where we knew that until 9-11, until the whole conflict in, so, in, in, uh, in Afghanistan, there was really no animosity between, let's say, Al-Qaeda and uh, US, for example. It's after the Kuwait invasion by Saddam that things started getting bad between, uh, between uh, uh, Al-Qaeda and US. That's when the first conflict started. Then the whole ideologies of Western civilization versus uh, Islamic civilization and the Middle East and the Eastern clash started happening. That's the initial background. After that, you had a complete, the whole, the entire region dramatically changed overnight because President Bush announced a war, invaded uh, Afghanistan first after the 9-11 attack. And in the same backdrop using as uh, Sudin said WMD and uh, weapons of mass destruction and the fact that Saddam politically was becoming a headache for uh, Americans for almost a decade since after the end of the Iraq war and the first invasion of Kuwait in the 90, early 90s. Bush presidency, as we all now know in hindsight, that they decided that let's go it once and for all, you know, let's take Saddam out. That, I think, opened literally the, the mess that we are seeing now. The entire septic tank was just, the lid was just opened up. It was all simmering inside. Taking Saddam out just brought out the entire uh, mess that we see now today. Now, what happened after that is that once Saddam was taken out, a Sunni ruler who was ruling majority Shia, you, who are, you had a new Shia regime coming into place. And the Shia regime started dictating its terms, led by Prime Minister Maliki until last week. And for almost last eight, eight, eight odd years, you had uh, entirely very much uh, sectarian-oriented policies of the Iraqi government under Shia, which were like very much anti-Sunni. And that built up grievances in, among the Sunni population of Iraq. Now this went on for eight years and that brings us almost till 2010 when uh, Mohammed Bouazi in Tunisia uh, did self-immolation and burnt himself, which has got nothing to do with this issue. But the frustration about democracy, trying to see what's happening in the Middle East, trying to see where other countries were going was, al was already building up. And this vegetable vendor suddenly one day out of frustration just because reportedly he was hit by a police officer, uh, a lady police officer. He lost his school, goes to the governorate and burns himself and uh, sets himself ablaze. And that's when the whole Arab Spring triggered. Now what has interestingly happened if you see in the Arab Spring is that you have local population fighting existing regimes. Now, after Tunisia, where the president, uh, Zinadin Ben Ali, within 15 days, he, he kind of uh, fled, fled from Tunisia, which was not very bloody uh, uprising. It was very politically strong uprising, but it was not that brutal as the other countries saw. He left, immediately the spark spread into Egypt against Mubarak, who was already ruling for 32 years, 30, 32 years. So there was a deep discontentment already existing in the population who wanted to see new leadership. This entire region is very young, you know, majority of the population is young, exposed to modern technology, social media, which has been a, one of the biggest mobilizing factor, you know, in all these uprisings in all these three, four countries. And they were tired of seeing the same corrupt face and government for decades since their father's generation. Whether it is Mubarak, who was 80 when he was toppled, whether it was immediately in Libya, Simultaneously, you had uprising starting in Libya, which was against uh, the then super uh, leader of uh, Libya, Mr. Muammar Gaddafi, who had been ruling for 42 years. You know, now people, like the entire generation has been watching every day just the same leader, who was not a great leader, dictator, brutal in, its, in his uh, running of the political system, and the same face for decades and decades. People were just tired and waiting, and this, they got this trigger. Everything started happening at the same time. Immediately, around the same time, within a month, you had a similar uprising in Syria, because there was the Assad family which was ruling for the last 40 years. Assad and his father, Hafez Assad, was ruling extremely arrogantly, brutally. Simultaneously, the same thing. Again, Syria and Libya were the two armed uprisings. 
Egypt was not armed uprising. Egypt people were civilian who protested democratically at at various squares, mainly iconic Tahrir Square, which today we has become so uh, has is now an iconic square that you know it will always be remembered for what has happened, which has taken two presidents toppled. This entire thing we now call as Arab Spring, which started in, in Tunisia and spread to Egypt, Libya, Syria, Yemen. It took four presidents within a year. Mubarak was toppled. Um, ben Ali was, he, he, he fled in Tunisia. Abdullah Saleh of Yemen stepped down. And uh, the biggest incident of 2011 was Gaddafi's killing, head of the state being captured and killed. You know, it doesn't happen all the time in history. One of the, it's very rare uh, incidents and examples we have. Probably we had uh, Najibullah who was hanged in Afghanistan and before that Romanian president in the 70s. So that doesn't happen very much. It's, it's, these are events which changes history. You know, they just the history of that country, of the region changes dramatically with such uh, big incidents. And that's what happened. Gaddafi was killed by his own people. So Syria and this and Libya were armed uprisings where people, people like you and me, took up, you know, they picked up arms and started fighting their own regime uh, forces. And uh, as the uprising became more bloody, bloodier and bloodier, of course, NATO had to intervene, especially in Syria, uh, in Libya. And then you had air support coming from NATO forces led by US and France, and ground troops were entirely uh, rebels, which were the local people. And that's how, finally, on October 20, 2011, Gaddafi was captured in his hometown, Sir, and uh, within minutes after his capturing, he was uh, killed. He was shot dead by one of the uh, rebels who captured him. That was the biggest uh, Arab Spring incident of uh, 2011, apart from uh, the other presidents uh, falling down. But what, what really happened after that and is still continuing is Syrian conflict. Syrian conflict is exactly opposite of what happened in Iraq. Syria, you have a president who is a, one of the sect of Shia Islam, while the population is Sunni. So there, it's the other way around. Like Saddam was Sunni, but the population was Shia. Here it is exactly the other way, the opposite. And reports indicate that a lot of the, fire, the people who are fighting Assad's forces for the last more than three years have strong backing, coming so strong funding, uh, regular supply of arms, uh, mobilization of fighters to take on forces of uh, Assad. And you literally have a regional conflict, which is no more just about Syria. It's now about region. In the sense, Assad being a sect of Shia is strongly supported by Hezbollah, which is a Shia unit from Lebanon. So they send their fighters reportedly, I would again say. And you have the biggest Shia country, Iran, which also funds, finances uh, Assad, uh, Assad government in a big way. So you have a complete uh, proxy war in a sense that on one side you have Shia forces, directly, indirectly. Other side you have uh, probably a lot of Sunni uh, countries which are backing the Sunni Islamists who are fighting against Assad. And this didn't happen before. Suddenly this has happened. So now you have this whole uh, regional conflict uh, happening where literally you're seeing the two ideological uh, sects fighting militarily in its own way, backed by established powerful governments. And uh, you know, you have lakhs of people uh, getting killed in the bargain. Now, in this whole thing is what we probably is a recent topic that we have been discussing for the last one week, is where does this IS comes from? Which is this group suddenly which has come, uh, everybody knew we have literally grown up uh, for the last 20 years, we are hearing Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda. Who, what is this IS all about? Who are these people? Who, who, who are the fighters? Where are they coming from? And that question came glaringly again uh, this week when uh, my colleague James Foley, was uh, uh, beheaded. Uh, he, he disappeared in November 2012 from Syria. The last I met him was probably three, four days before Gaddafi's killing in Libya. We met uh, on the front line in Libya in Sirte, and he was with another unit of uh, AFP, and he was not just working for us, he was also working for Global Post uh, magazine newspaper. 
and then and he was contributing for us so we met right on the front line he literally crisscrossed like 10 12 kilometers of front line just to meet me and my team and then he went back again so th those were the last image i have i have about him after libyan revolution uprising ending gaddafi's killing the syrian uprising was still continuing so he went into syria and he continued to cover and then one day we lost contact like november 12 uh, november 22 uh, 2012, that was the last we got anything from him until last week when uh, uh, the beheading uh, video was released and it was confirmed that it was him. And it was done by IS. So, so what is this IS? Who are, the, who are these people? What happened is another uh, interesting uh, and iconic incident is the killing of uh, Osama bin Laden. Now, immediately after his killing, there was this vacuum in al-Qaeda top leadership as to who takes over al-Qaeda's charge. Because for al-Qaeda, the mission is still incomplete. You, you, you are continuing to fight uh, US, the Western ideology, the Western civilization. So it's a clash of civilization. It's not just about US and Iraq. So who will? And that's when there was a debate going on as to whether Mr. Zawahiri, Dr. Zawahiri, should lead al-Qaeda or not. A lot of people didn't agree to he becoming uh, the leader of Al-Qaeda, because he is highly respected as scholarly theologian, but people, his critics say that he lacks uh, battlefield experience, which uh, Osama had, or uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who masterminded the 9-11, the Pakistan uh, uh, individual who was captured for 9-11. Uh, for he, he was the main mastermind. So they said, his critics say that, you know, he lacks uh, experience to, to lead a team on the battlefield. And that's when a small group kind of uh, separated from the mainstream Al-Qaeda. Also what, what Mr. Zawahiri did is that he has created small individual units. There is no more one Al-Qaeda and then people, and, and there is one head who is sending messages across like the way uh, Mr. Laden is today. That's not the way it, it is now. What they do is they have given, they have set up individual branches, like subunits of a corporate, you know. There is one is a Iraq unit, there is one which is a Syria unit, there is one which is a Yemen unit, and each has his head. Full freedom is given to, to take decisions, to plan out strategy, but lead the battle at that. This is how uh, Al-Qaeda has transformed itself after uh, uh, Mr. Laden's killing. Uh, but, so this group, which was not very happy of uh, Dr. Zawahiri taking over, decided that we will break away and we will set up our own unit. And that group was led by uh, this upcoming very aggressive militant uh, called uh, Abu Bakr Baghdadi, who is an Iraqi. He set up this in uh, April, March, 2000, March, April 2013. And he took his forces and started entering into Syria. The first thing he did was to fight Syria, inside Syria against Assad's forces, along with, or side by side, already existing Al-Qaeda group, which was also fighting against Assad. So there were two. Al-Qaeda unit is called uh, Jabhat Nasra, you know, like uh, the group to support Syria. That's the translation. So they were fighting against Assad. And then these guys also entered, uh, which is known as Islamic State of Iraq and Levant initially. Now it is just known as Islamic State. And this group started fighting Assad's forces. For the last three years, they have been fighting. At the same time, the, 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 the difference that is there in Al-Qaeda and IS and that's where the whole thing of future uh, militant uh, fighting that we will witness will come is that this group, IS, doesn't believe only in uh, triggering car bombs or setting off uh, bombs or suicide bombs. Or just, it believes in battlefield fighting, like a proper uh, straight on combat, you know, with anybody who, is, who doesn't believe in their ideology. So not necessary, it's only existing regime forces. No, it can be anybody. It, it can be you, me, anybody who doesn't believe in their ideology. They, can, they believe in battlefield combat. And most important, not just battlefield combat, but capturing territories. So it's been a long time we have seen something like this where they captured it. Probably uh, Sri Lanka LTT was having its own mini uh, government in the northeast of Sri Lanka. They, they were the ones who had proper capturing territory, but there has not been any Islamic militant group which captured territory and, and retaining it. And that's what they have been, which has stunned the world today, right? Like, what is this group? How they have just grown in three years to be the number one 
uh, fighting machine against established forces. And it is attracting fighters. Experts, terrorism experts say that they have around 15,000 to 20,000 fighters, which is a huge number. And it's increasingly attracting young uh, fighters, jihadis from anywhere across the world, not just the Middle East, but even uh, Europe and the West. And to me, I think the one reason is purely because they are retaining territory. The more they retain territory, the more attractive it becomes. Because then you can establish your rule, establish your ideology, set up your own government, you know, install your own judicial systems. It's just run the entire territory the way you would run a, a country, a government, and it believes in X, Y. It has already uh, lightening offenses which it has launched in the last uh, uh, six months in Iraq, for example, and three years in, in Syria. It has captured uh, almost entire northwest in Iraq, some of the biggest cities, which, which means it brings under its control some key infrastructure and assets. People, experts say it, it, it already has assets worth two to three billion dollars under its control, you know. And then it has also has some territories in, in Syria which is under its control. And it is already now establishing its rule. So last month you must have read some news saying that this, this Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi has declared a caliphate. You know, after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, uh, the dream of a caliphate, we will, we will fulfill and he is the Khalifa. You know, uh, and uh, that's so, so they want to establish uh, a government which just uh, spans, literally pans out entirely from across, uh, not just in Iraq, but the whole uh, Levant as much as possible, whether it is Iraq, Syria, possibly even Lebanon, and all these countries are getting dragged. And as I said, the more uh, Abu, Abu Bakr Baghdadi becomes powerful and is able to capture territory and retain it, the more attractive he becomes. And what has really stunned is last week's beheading, which reportedly is done by uh, a British accent uh, speaking uh, uh, militant who beheaded him, is something really to watch on her hand, has really sent shivers down the Western governments and okay, like, what are we now tackling? Does it mean that we have more and more people from our countries getting into these, these conflict zones, getting battle hardened, uh, getting properly trained, and when they come back into our countries, what are they going to do? Because now it is not just about ideology, it is about ideology and rule. And in all this thing, they have, they have got an argument which happened in Egypt to some extent. And Egypt, as Sudin said, you had a democratically elected president after Mubarak's stepping down and his ouster. You had a democratically elected first Egypt's first president, civilian president in Egypt's entire history was democratically elected first time. And one year after that, he was removed from power by the military on the back of popular uprising again against him. But the point these militant groups say is that, what's the point of having a democratically elected president when he's going to be removed from power? Let us capture by violence. It doesn't make sense to have democracy. You know, it can go out of the door. It can go take a walk, democracy. We, we tried to have democracy in Egypt. What happened? A democratically elected president and administration boy was removed by, uh, by force, uh, ousted uh, within a year. He was not even given time to uh, end his entire term of four years, and he was removed. Why should we be democratic? You know? And that's where the question is coming. They have that argument, and that's where you are having not just people like IS, but you have a lot of small, small groups uh, as we call sometimes the lone wolves, you know, small cells, they uh, start operating on their own. You have uh, big uh, governments, we don't know, but big wealthy individuals who back these people across that region. A lot of time people say, what is the role of Qatar? How is Qatar emerging so much, as we were discussing outside Radha? What is Qatar doing? How come it is emerging so much? On Why are people suddenly talking about Qatar, such a small, tiny island uh, country? Gas rich, it has tremendous wealth, it has a powerful media machine called Al Jazeera. And why are they suddenly emerging? In fact, reports indicate that uh, they had even troops in Libya against Gaddafi. Why is Qatar fighting uh, existing regimes? And what is the agenda of Qatar? Uh, why is it uh, supporting Muslim Brotherhood, which was the party of which the government uh, 
the president was elected in Egypt. So all these questions are emerging because there is a big split happening in the entire in that entire MENA region, Middle East, North Africa, where you have the ideologies clashing, and you have this strong, earnest desire to uh, make your voice heard, which comes from the people. But many times, it is getting completely misguided, sidelined, sidetracked, and sometimes you just feel that, are we back to square one? Like, for example, in Egypt, a lot of people ask, you took out an army general, former army general, who was Mubarak, and now you again have a new army general who is now a civilian president, but his army. So what really happened in three years of completely traumatic uprising upheavals? What happened? Is, is a country like Egypt back to square one? I would say no. It's not, it, it has taken two steps back, but it's not completely over simply because people still are now trained or have got the strength to question. That is the big change on the ground in a country like Egypt. People question. Right now, yes, General Sisi is back. He's, he's backed by millions who want stability in a country like Egypt. But definitely the question is if he is not able to pick off the, to do something good with the economy, bring, uh, increase country's revenues, bring back the tourists who have disappeared in the last three years and takes the economy back on track. If he's, if he's not going to do that, you never know what he has uh, issues on his hand. It's going to be very tough even for him because people are questioning. It's not the same. The clock has not turned back completely. Yes, they have taken two, three steps back. It's like literally uh, entire uh, machinery is back again, the state machinery. And we also have to understand the fact that all, most countries in this region, in fact, the whole region is literally ruled by security apparatus. It's the police and the army which rules these countries and people are fed up with that. That's also one of the big reasons why Arab Spring happened. People were very uh, completely uh, angry, furious with the police, uh, with, the, uh, with the armed forces who are and army generals and military uh, ruling their lives for decades and decades. And in a country like Egypt, they feel, are these people back? Is the security apparatus back? So that's the question. But then somebody like me, I feel that no, it's not completely going to be the same. Yes, things are very bad at the moment. They look very depressive, but things may change because people are questioning. Uh, so this is, this is in short what's happening in that region. A lot of things we can discuss, but personally I would like to just stop one way here and then maybe take questions and then we will come up with more and more uh, angles to the whole thing. But the bottom line is that you have the ideological clashes. You have three various groups fighting. You are, on one hand, you have the jihadis fighting existing regimes. You have armed rebellion happening where people are turning into rebels fighting existing regimes. And then you also have existing forces who are combating all this. And in this entire uh, mess, you have a simultaneous mess, which is uh, the Israel-Palestinian uh, uh, problem which is which is a historical problem which is which is continuously going on and that but that's completely different which i won't connect with this in terms of particularly because that is to me it's a homeland conflict it's not really about religion you know it's it's about homeland which now has been colored by uh, the whole arab jew conflict and uh, uh, ethnic groups and all fighting but basically it is a homeland it is a palestinian uh, desire to have a state for the last uh, six, seven decades, especially since Israel's declaration of statehood in 48. And since then, they have been fighting uh, the conflict. To me, it is the mother of all conflicts. End of the day, it is the mother of all conflicts. And if that conflict is solved, a lot of other issues can be uh, addressed and something can come out. But that conflict has to be, uh, has to be the really uh, prime agenda of world powers to see that, you know, that is solved. And, Nothing much is really happening. Even as we speak right now, the conflict is still on. People are still dying in Gaza. Uh, Gaza, Gaza militants are firing rockets in Israel. Israel is bombing them. So that's still going on. So this is what I would just like to stop here so that it doesn't go on with the, just one way. But if there is a question, then we can have much more uh, dialogue. Or maybe Sudhin uh, has a question, and we can start from there. Yeah. If there are questions. Gaza is a, is a humanitarian disaster, if you have to uh, if you really uh, understand. 
It's a, it's a strip which has around 20 lakh people staying and completely sealed off by Israeli forces on all the crossings for the last seven, eight years at least. You just can't go out and you just can't come in. You know, imagine you stay in your building and the gate is locked and you just can't go out for years and years. You are just inside. So just magnify that and you will see that's how, uh, how Gaza is. There's just one opening, the Rafa opening with Egypt, which is open once in a while for medical emergencies or VIP people coming in and some important uh, delegations coming and going. And that's when, uh, so that is one of the biggest problems in, in the Palestinian uh, cause and issue at the moment. So that's when you have a Hamas group called Hamas, which, you know, which, are, you know, which rose up from that conflict and is now fighting Israel uh, militarily. And right now is one of the third or the fourth direct conflict going on as we speak. So this is essentially a homeland conflict where the, well, Israel feels that it is threatened by Palestinians and Arabs uh, from all the sides, while the Palestinians feel that we need a country, we need a homeland, and there is a tremendous distrust and anger between the two groups, which, is, which we call in international parlance as Arab-Israeli conflict or Arab-Jew conflict. So it's essentially a homeland war, uh, which, is, which, as I said, is the mother of all conflicts. You know, unless that problem is solved, a lot of terror-related issues will continue. 